It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Abdul Aziz Saeed. He is the founding director of the Center for International Peace at American University. He is also the first professor to hold the Mohammed Saeed Farsi Chair of Islamic Peace. So Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, to continue, Dr. Said has served as advisor to the Democratic Principles Working Group of the Department of State's Future of Iraq Project and as a consultant to the members of the Iraqi Governing Council. In addition, he has also served as a consultant to both the United Nations Development Program and UNESCO. Dr. Said has written, co-authored, or edited more than 17 books and he is currently working on promoting the concept of localizing peace, which uh, utilizes cultural memory as well as local traditions and methods to develop more effective and sustainable conflict uh, prevention and resolution practices. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Saeed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have to have it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Well, this is, we, have, we have to find a way of keeping this. Thank you. Leave the cameras down if you don't mind. Yeah, let's focus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let us remember all the children, women, and men on the planet who suffer and who are victims of violence, injustice, and environmental degradation. Let's remember them. And let us pray for all the children, women, and men who are working to make our planet a better world. My experience with culture and diplomacy professionally dates back to the Carter administration when American diplomats were taken as prisoners by the Iranian government in 1979. President Carter assembled a commission to meet with him and advise him on what to do with Iran and the Islamic world. We met in the cabinet room of the White House. And Brzezinski had just come back from Afghanistan and was praising the Taliban, the Mujahideen. 1979. A member of our group, young professor, asked President Carter, and bear in mind, the Shah of Iran was still alive. He said, Mr. President, do we intend to return the Shah of Iran back to Iran? Carter said, of course not. Why do you say that? He said, because the Iranians believe we are going to do that. He said, why should they still think that? He says, sir, because in 1953, we did that. Oh, he said, that was 1953. He says, sir, for the Iranians, 1953 is yesterday. Culture. That's interesting. It's yesterday. 53 is yesterday. 53 is today. So I'm happy we are together. Let me take about half an hour to share with you some thoughts. Politics is a cultural activity. It is a cultural activity. 
and international politics is cultural communication in disguise. We give it different names, national interest, national, give it any names. But it is cultural communication in disguise. I just want to keep thoughts with us because like you, I am trained in looking at big problems to focus on the tangibles, meaning power, economics, technology. But I have not been trained to look also at the intangibles, feelings, emotions, beliefs, ah, that's messy. But what happens, the outcome when we, in our analysis, when we are focusing only on the tangibles and overlook the intangibles, we reduce phenomenon to what? To distortions, to generalizations. Uh, we call it terrorism, fundamentalism, they call it imperialism, both sides do that. So part of our being together is to recognize the cultural context. The cultural context. Yeah. That's, yeah. So let me share with you eight points since I work on the West and Islam, the Middle East and the West. Western Islamic relations at this point, at this time, is at a point of crisis. No less than when President Obama went to Cairo. Time, at, time of danger, time of challenge. However, the good news, we have options. That's what I want to talk about both sides. We have options because we need one another. And we have options because we are both here to stay. Westerners and Muslims need to experience themselves in relationship, not out of relationship. That's important. How do we experience ourselves in relationship, not out of relationship? I mentioned President Carter, but I had also another experience. 9-11. 9-11, the Under Secretary of State of the United States, Charlotte Beers, God bless her, lovely lady, invited a group of us to help her. What to do? Anyone remembers Charlotte Beers? B-E-E-R-S. Okay. Under Secretary of public diplomacy. We were there, and we, a group of us, uh, we were invited more or less as academic experts, and we agreed among ourselves how to communicate. When we arrived on the sector of Charles Beer, she said, I'm happy you are here. I'm going to show you what we are trying to do, PR in the Islamic world. We said, Madam, <laughs> What's going on here? But we checked her background. She had come to, to State Department from being president of some public relations firm before she came. <laughs> Lovely lady. We became friends. That was not the issue, but... <laughs> <laughs> so let me share with you eight points. Number one. We need to strategize for conflict transformation. Generally speaking, current American and Western policies manifest an overriding concern to control the direction of events. Whether, well, on the other hand, Muslims are trying to change things. That's That's, so that's, that's a challenge we face. Rather than conflict 
management or conflict escalation, we need cooperative strategies of conflict transformation that address the sources of current tensions. The U.S. and other Western countries need now to look more at that issue. In the long run, one of the most critical tasks for peace building is depriving violent extremism of legitimacy. So that's my first point. Second point, strengthen diplomatic preparedness. Strengthen diplomatic preparedness. Diplomatic discourse intended to win friends, to win, I'm sorry, to win trust rather than cause offense should give increased weight to multilateralism. Indeed, if we are going to strengthen diplomatic preparedness, we have to underscore multilateralism. We have to underscore cultural pluralism. We have to underscore respect, inclusion, and consensus building. So when I talk about strengthening diplomatic preparedness, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking also about communicating respect. And by that, underscoring the emergent global ethic that is emerged through interreligious, intercultural dialogue that was referred to earlier by Maria Jessup. We need to also connect policy principles to a search for shared values. Remember, I started by saying, politics is a cultural activity. For too long, as an academic, I have been in doing my work for, since 1957. And when you think back, those of you who are academics, young academics, older academics, may remember that for a long time we did not look at culture. In the 50s, 60s, we did not look at culture because we couldn't measure it. We couldn't quantify it. We are now looking more and more at culture. Number three, insist on negotiated solutions. Let me underscore what I mean by negotiated solutions. Denying radical groups a chance to develop a stake in their political process can make things worse, not better. Negotiated solutions not impose solutions. Because radicalism feeds on unresolved conflict. So that's, yes. Also, willingness to engage with Islamic movements can give more credibility. We are trying to do that now. In Tunisia, in Egypt, uh, Yemen, uh, the, anyone remembers the name of the person who won the Nobel Peace Prize for Peace this year? Tawakkul Karman, Yemeni. She belongs to a religious Islamic uh, group in Yemen. And very importantly, rather than seek to manipulate, as we are doing now with the United States, rather than seek to manipulate the intra-regional rivalries between Sunni and Shia Muslims, we should generate more lasting contributions to security through collaborative efforts. Because as you know what is happening now, we are happy with Turkey and Sunni Muslims. Iran is a Shia Muslim. Iran is working with Syria, with Hezbollah. And not that we started the civil war in Islam. The civil war is here. But we are becoming part of it. We are taking sides in it. And what I'm saying, we don't need to take sides.
Yes, and by working together to formulate proposals for interreligious second track, and we need to do that, Westerners and Muslims could refrain, prevent the conflict from evolving more and reframe, and what, what I'm calling for now, to reframe the conflict between Israel and the Arabs as a feud within the Abrahamic, Abrahamic family. Reframe it that way. It's a feud within the Abrahamic family rather than as an interreligious collision, a crusade between the defense of democracy and Islam. Hey, wait a little. It's not a crusade. We should work with both sides within the Abrahamic family to deal with that. Number four, which we are doing, but we should do much more, support change from within the Islamic world. Now, what we need to do more here, supporting within the Islamic world, is not to close our eyes to Bahrain, where the Shias are saying, hey, look here to the ru ruling family. We are marginalized. So what's happening? We are closing our eyes to Bahrain, where the Saudi Arabians have sent troops, and where we have our fleet. Hey, wait a little. Indeed, if we want to support change from within, we have, we have to tell the Bahrainis, as I tried three weeks ago, to no avail. I met with them, said, look here. Bullets are not going to do it. Yeah. Dialogue will do it. And you would be proud of me, Mary, I gave them some information on how to conduct dialogue. And they say, you cannot conduct dialogue while ta tanks are on the streets. So support change from within, important. I'll tell you why it's important. And I mentioned, I mentioned this to Saudi diplomats yesterday. What has been going on in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Syria, in Yemen, gradually will move to Saudi Arabia, to Kuwait, to the United Arab Emirates to Qatar. That's one of the reasons why the Qataris, Saudis, are supporting the opposition in Syria, because to protect their own interests. What we see now, the militarism and some of the authoritarian religious regimes are getting together. And also, peace in the Middle East needs to be locally rooted, what I call localizing peace. Local resources for peace take many forms. They are present in religious and conflict value systems, in historical memories, and narratives of conflict, conflicts resolved already in culture-specific vocabularies for speaking about policymaking, and in indigenous and often informal processes of community dispute resolution. They are there, there. Yeah. Because my dearly beloved friends, beautiful people, uh, peace is a very fragile flower that can only survive. In its, in its soil, yeah, yeah. otherwise, or democracy for that matter. Yeah. Number five, use public diplomacy to listen as well as to speak. Going back to Maria Jessup, use public diplomacy to listen as well as to speak. When we're invited by Charlotte Beers, we don't see that. Nor do we see much of it, nor much has changed. I love President Obama. I voted for him. I'll vote for him again. That's not the issue. Obama, President Obama, operates within a context, within structures. Yeah, yeah. 
And the structures, you and me, are the people who are upholding those structures. Let's face it. Yeah, yeah. That's, we are upholding those structures. So use public diplomacy to listen as well as to speak. Uh, we are trying to sell a product that's not sellable. So when Charlotte Bees invited us, we did share with Andre Sakti Bees, look here. The question is not your technique, but the product that you have. You can sell it. We need a different product. You may give it many different names, but the product has to change. Okay. Okay, that was spoken about earlier. I'm trying to make it as, to give us time for question and answer. An effective public diplomacy strategy starts with actively listening to voices in the region, not only to the words that, and their ideas. Okay, I mentioned that. Let me go to number six. Support intercultural and interreligious dialogue. Within the partnership, visible partnerships across cultures, religious and political devices are not a panacea, but they are invaluable. We have to do with them. We have to advance bridge building efforts, Western as well as Muslim, and encourage interreligious dialogue, multi-faith projects, and coexistence initiatives. We are doing that. We can do mo much more than that. It's not enough to condemn rad radical religion. People need positive examples of faith-based engagements that channel religious energies towards positive alternative visions. Number seven, for me very important, I'm learning more and more about this, support religious peacemaking. And here, part of what I'm calling for uh, we have the United States Institute of Peace, great. And we have Maria and other great people in it. When I talk about supporting religious peacemaking, I am calling for the establishment of Interfaith Institute of Peace. Interfaith Institutes, Institutes of Peace. Interfaith Institute of Peace where we can bring Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, Jews, you name it, Native Americans, to learn from them what it is in their cultures that will help all of us. Because throughout history, my dearly beloved young beautiful people, throughout history, peace has been conceptualized by the dominant culture and imposed by force upon the others. What I'm calling for is something different. A peace that is reflective of different values and different cultures. It's no accident that the 20th century became a century of total war because we have never had a notion of total peace. And we have to move towards that. A notion of whole peace. Not segments, not peace of peace, controlled by the dominant culture. So an interfaith, interfaith instance of peace. Hey, we could have some in the United States, Latin America, Europe, Africa, Middle East, Asia. And to do that, we need to establish an endowment to establish those interfaith instance of peace. They will have seminars, lectures, persons like Maria Stefan to look at peace, different traditions. I would like to hear from 
Muslims, Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, and others. The following question. What does your tradition bring to the table to deal with issues of poverty? Because poverty is the most pressing international issues. How do we deal with it? What does your culture bring to the table about how we deal with violence? What does your culture bring to the table how we deal with the environment? I mentioned violence, poverty, environment, three dominant issues facing us. You are reading the statistics. Don't go overseas in Washington. One out of four children live under poverty. And that's uh, yeah. And we also need global advocacy for to, uh, to develop an international convention for the protection of religious sites religious places, an international convention to protect them throughout the world. We don't have such a convention. How to protect, protect religious sites? And number eight, identify and implement intercultural confidence building measures. I will repeat, identify and implement intercultural confidence building measures. Dealing with youth, how do we engage energies of youth? And many, many others. Supporting such initiatives as the Alliance of Civilization of the United Nations. Okay, let me come to a conclusion to give us time for questions and answers. I have very simple four points in my conclusion. Thank you very much. My I have four points. Let me finish them. Number one, Islam and the West are truly between stories. Between the stories of the past and the story that they must now create together. All of us who identify with Islam and the West can become architects of the new story. I'm inviting all of us to be architects of this new story. Not only between Islam and the West, but since we have Buddhists, Hindus, and us, that's the architects of that new story. Number two. Security, and let me underscore that I was trained in international relations, and I have been working in international relations since 1957. What I have learned, security is no longer the private good of a particular country that may be purchased at the expense of others. Security has become a public good. It's not a private good. Like air is a public good. Environment is a public good, security is a public good. As peace is a public good. That's my second point. My third point. Morality is a public good. Morality is a public good. Morality. And now people say, who's morality? That's why we have to get together. We have to get together. It's a public good. Because it, we need that public good for, human, for our well-being. We cannot separate security from justice anymore. We can't. They have to be connected. And my fourth last point. We have moved from an environment, historically, when nations met, 
in a process of mutual exploitation. Tell what I'm calling for, for a new meeting. In this new meeting, the West will give the East the best it has in exchange of getting from the East the best the East has. The North gives the South the best it has in exchange of getting from them the best. Exchange of the best for the best. The exchange of the best for the best. Thank you. <laughs> yes.